bueno, primeramente, en el, eh, first of all, in Spanish, sorry. <laughs> bueno, gracias a todos ustedes por asistir a esta última sesión de Rayo contra el Cáncer. Tenemos con nosotros otra vez a Dr. Peter Sandwell, quien nos dio antes, el martes, y él va a continuar hablando de Quality Assurance. Y estamos agradecidos por su tiempo, por nos, nos ha dado dos sesiones. Entonces, con eso vamos a pasar el tiempo a él. So, thank you all for being here for this last session of Rigel Contra Cancer with Dr. Peter Sandwell, who's given us the last session as well. This will be the last one of our curriculum, and he'll be over continuing over quality assurance. With that, I'd like to pass the time over to Dr. Sandwell. All right. Thank you, Michael. Yep. Dr. Sandwell, or Peter, as the world knows me. This is a picture of La Paz, just similar to Tuesday. So this is just starting out again. And there will be some overlap. And I think that that's important in education, kind of things build up on each other. So I'll be touching on similar things and similar concepts, but focusing much more on imaging, since that is the topic. So as before, I think an initial condition towards doing anything or implementing any technology and, and stereotactic is very heavy in technology is, is looking at what's out there, what documentation or, or what professional society guidance are out there. And ASTRO, AAPM, IEAE, these all have great resources available. It, it would take a lifetime to read everything that's been published, but looking at these task groups can really help narrow it down. So some of the knowledge points, as before, we talked about quality. And I'll talk about quality again because it, it, it's quality assurance is just an aspect of quality control and, and, and what quality is is, is constantly um, evolving. I'll, I'll talk about imaging for, for planning and imaging for treatment because imaging is integral to what we do now. So there, these are some major documents or, or some high-level documents that are, are, are definitely worth reading. There's the ASTRO Quality and Safety White Paper that was published in 2013, focused on IGRT. There was the, the AAPM Medical Physics Practice Guideline for IGRT in 2014. And then just recently, last year, IEAE published a, a, a guidance document for introducing IGRT in clinical practice. And I think that sometimes we, we, you know, everybody here is interested in stereotactic. So there's maybe there's an assumption that everyone's familiar with IGRT, but I think that that, that might not be the case. The IGRT is kind of taken for granted in a lot of, in a lot of respects in, in the States. I think that there is definitely an evolution that needs to kind of, that, that we've experienced in the States where we've gone from 3D to image guidance, to IMRT, to IGRT, on, on, online IGRT, and then stereotactic. Whereas a lot of centers elsewhere, at least from my experience, are just going from zero to 60. So they're, they're really ramping up quickly, where, where traditionally they've, they've done 2D, and then they're jumping right all the way into a modern machine capable of doing all the latest and greatest. So looking back and, and taking advantage of, of these documents, especially for technologists, is, is really helpful. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of papers that have been written on IGRT and IGRT technology. So these are, this is a group, this is just a, a, a table, a, a table, a, a tabulation of the different task groups for the different imaging modalities. And, and there's, they're plentiful. This, this last one, 147 over here, actually talks about non-radiographic ones. And it, it's, it's not even super current, so there'll be, new, there'll, be newer ones, uh, there'll be newer ones coming out. But it does mention, it does discuss the technology of surface-guided radiotherapy, which is a non-radiographic type of imaging. And this is really gaining a lot of popularity, and, and uh, even with stereotactic, I think University of California, San Diego, they've done trigeminals with using surface guided imaging. So there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of stuff out there and, and, and we're not gonna focus on the technology as much as on the, the, the concept of quality. So 
as before, uh, you know, when we talked about stereoty a stereotypic program, the end-to-end -end tests are essential. They, they, they're critical. And, and I've, I've showed a few different phantoms because you can be creative and, and do it in, in different ways. There's lots of different ways to do these. If you have a rando phantom, that's great. Or if you have a Lucy phantom, maybe that's even better since it's got different imaging inserts. There, there are other, you could be creative, you could make your own out of, you know, out of a gl glass or a plastic, fill it with water, put an iron chamber in there. Or you could, like I said before, you can use a, a ham. But I, I think it should, be, it should be noted that you don't need the, the $30,000 quality assurance device to still perform the tasks to assess your quality. But the end-to-end -end test is really important because it establishes your uncertainty. It, 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 it creates a baseline for what you can achieve. And what you can do is you can repeat it each time, narrowing down on the, on the areas uh, where you think that things got a little fuzzier. And you can significantly improve your delivery. It's, and it's just through practice, but systematic practice and, and identifying the weak links in the chain. And we'll come back to that, but it, it really, end-to-end -end test should be there so you can establish your, your level of uncertainty. So with regard to quality assurance and imaging, talk a little bit about, in treatment planning, we'll talk about the different modalities or techniques that you can use. Talk about a little bit about registration and fusion, the quality assurance involved in those things. And then for treatment delivery, you know, focusing on what, on what counts. And, and a lot of it is communication. So, you know, the end-to-end -end tests and different quality assurance tests, we're going to figure out what our uncertainty is. But we can have a really accurate system. And if we're not communicating uh, our needs or communicating what's important to the patient appropriately to the people that are delivering the beam, then, then it's, it's all for naught. And we also want to acknowledge our uncertainty. There are a lot of areas that, 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 that are a little fuzzy. We want to quantify that fuzziness and know what it is so that we can minimize it. So acknowledging uncertainty is important and, and um, not saying that it's okay, saying you find it and then you, and then you work to whittle it down, but you have to be able to measure it to, to do that. So as we, as we know, Imaging is critical to modern radiotherapy. There's, it's, 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 part of, it's part and parcel to what we do. You know, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, they, 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 maybe they, they put them up and did a, a separation. But today, you know, we're doing a CT scan of, of most patients. And I know that's not the case for everyone. Some people just use x-rays. But for the most part, and especially in, in context of stereotactic, we're going to be having CTs of the, of the patient. We're going to use that PT, to, either we're going to use that CT to define the target volume. And there are uncertainties in that definition. And then that translates to uncertainties in, or not uncertainties, but into the margins that we're going to apply to that, those, that tumor that we've defined. And that, that margin really comes from the, the fuzziness here, but it, but it also should account for the fuzziness here because there's also imaging now in, in delivery. And for stereotactic, imaging is, is, is critical. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's part of the whole thing. Same with IMRT. Imaging is an essential element to the, the delivery of these highly complex treatments. So this is what I, I had mentioned before. Kind of want to, this is something that I, I think is important to, to conceptualize and, and, and to, to carry with us is, is the fact that there, there's these two philosophies for quality control. There, there's, there's one where we look forward and there's one where we look back. So the perspective is the most powerful because it can show us where to focus and we can prevent an error um, before it occurs. They say, so, you know, a stitch in time is worth nine. So it's, it's or an ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. So if we look at the if we look at the entire process, we can identify not only the, the, this major step, but what are the sub processes involved in this that might lead to either uh, an error or what could, what could improve this, this, this process. And, and we don't really, 
it's hard to appreciate it and identify it without mapping it out. We use a map to, to so we can so we can work through it. So it's getting a good process map is essential. Uh, analyzing your process flow and looking for those 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 weak points. I, I'm I'm highlighting this 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 protocol selection because that's that's the first part. So if you if you make a mistake here, it's going to translate all the way down the chain, uh, and we're not going to have as good outcomes. So the so the the further back we can look and the and the, the further downstream we can focus on on correcting any errors the better it's going to be because we know that the errors propagate so once we've made a, a mistake then then we're, it's just kind of it's getting wider and wider the looking back is is also important looking at mistakes that are made and analyzing those or or even better mistakes that others have made if you can learn from others mistakes then you're 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 a very wealthy person so to prevent that repetition, and then, you know, maybe there are new controls that need to be created such that, such that might be automatic protocols. Only there's only a few protocols to choose from instead of having the individual at the, at the simulator program up for each patient. There's a couple of ones that we know are, are work, that work. But uh, the hybrid approach is idea, looking at the prospective and the retrospective. And again, this is, this is a repeat. Because these are these are things that are, I think, are important. So, statistical process control it's it's a, it's a really great tool. That that's Shuhart here, doing his work at Bell Labs. And there's a lot of amazing stuff that came out of Bell Laboratories. And, you know, the transistor being being a big one. But his his background in statistics and in industrial control, he looked for a way to improve processes, to improve production line processes. But, it, but with, with regard to radiotherapy, it's, it's, it's a similar thing. You, 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 you monitor the process, you, you assign a value to it, whether, it, whether it's a quality measure of say, you know, the, the, the Hounsfield units on a CT scanner. And then, you, and then you, you set thresholds. You understand that there's gonna be noise in everything that we do. And so a little bit of, a little bit of variation is normal, but then th setting thresholds so that you know when um, to intervene. And with regards to image guidance, you know, if we, as long as we're, we're, we're monitoring and we're looking, that, then we can learn. If we don't look, we're not going to be able to learn. But if we aggregate and analyze, so collect and, and look back at perhaps shifts, what we can do is we can, we can make value judgments on, on the margins. Are the, are the margins appropriate? Could, can, we, can we irradiate less normal tissue with confidence? And then also look at the, 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 the quality control of uh, the quality testing. Of, are the, is the image quality ideal? Is it, is it crisp enough? Is there something that, that we need to do to improve the, the resolution or, or the contrast? But we, we don't know if, we don't, if we're not recording it and, and looking at it in a, in a systematic fashion. So last time I, I shared this, this one over here where it had group one, which was before they had quality controls with, with planning, and then group, group two, the green, after they implemented quality controls. So just putting that in there, adding that quality control improved the outcome. And it's the same with image, in image guidance. Image guidance is itself quality assurance. We're verifying and we're ensuring that the patient is being placed in the right place. So before IGRT, there, there was this, this large variation and we accounted for that with margins uh, and we also kind of understand that, that things blur out over time. When, when IGRT was first implemented in a lot of places, it was implemented in an, in an offline manner. In which case they would the, they would collect several measurements, and then they would then they would shift as appropriate. It wasn't done on the day of, but now that we're doing more online IGRT, where we where, where we're shifting, and, and in case of stereotactic, where the physician is often at the console, we're getting a lot lot better at at, at getting the, the the patient in the right position. And I think that the big difference between this offline and this online is actually just education. 
So, you know, the, the, the individuals turn the beam on, they, sometimes there, there's, there's need for, for extra guidance in, in, in either what to align to or, or, or what's important. And, and that's on all of us. So to control the process and, and to improve the quality, we need to have the objectives for image guidance and imaging on paper. It has to be clear and consistent. Whether it's, it's the simulation, the, the scanning protocol, the, the extents of the, the image, you know, from, from, the, from the hip to the shoulders or, or, or whatever it is, being clear about our needs and being clear about uh, expectations, what to align to. Are we going to align to bony anatomy? Are we going to align to soft tissue? If we're going to align to soft tissue, what are we going to place in greatest importance? Is it the bladder? Is it the rectum? Is it the prostate itself? The different things, being clear about what those goals are will, will help improve our quality. And, it, and again, this, this, the Deming cycle or the plan, do, check, act, it's, it's, that's the whole thing about quality. It doesn't stop once you've started. It, you've got to look back. And that's the whole, that's the whole beauty of the, the statistical process control is you have, you have a record of what you can achieve. You can, and then you can dial it in and you can see if you can actually, you can, you can reduce the noise and, and be more consistent. And I think that that's, that's what's really important in, in quality control is, is, is the fact that it's this continuous thing. It's not a one and done, it, it's just keep going. And I mentioned this, I shared this screen yesterday. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's not just to make us feel good. It, it, it actually has, it has an impact on, on outcomes. Quality improves outcomes. In this, in this case, this is adherence to the treatment planning quality, but it, it, I'll show you on the next slide, you know, imaging is, is critical in this. So, so ensuring that you're actually delivering what you expect to deliver, uh, it's gonna make a difference and it's gonna make a difference in, in people's lives. So whether you're a, a therapist, an oncologist, a physicist, you can feel, feel good about being tight on quality because it, it's, it's actually going to make a difference in the outcome. And so with regard to imaging and outcomes, it's a, it's a, long, it's a long journey that from, from diagnosis to outcome. That there, there are several steps involved, but what we do know is that the steps, the, that the, the uncertainty or, or the, the fuzziness in each step, it grows, it only grows. So that by the, by the time we get to the outcome, there, there might be a lot of uncertainty, but the, the, the more we can limit that uncertainty early on, the tighter that, that, that grouping is gonna be at the end. So with the, with the target delineate, delineation, if we can be really confident about that, we're gonna, we're gonna tighten this band. If the patient positioning is, is, is really, we're really confident about that, we're gonna tighten this band. The, the biology is another story, but we, can, we gotta focus on, on what we can limit and do our best to limit it. So the, again, the final, error, the final error bar is large, but every attempt is worth, to reduce it is worthwhile. And the, the impact of any single intervention may be small, but it, 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 it accumulates. So let's control what we can. So the, the delivery of, the accurate, of accurate stereotactic radiotherapy with the high doses, it's really important that, that we have strong implemented IGRT and, and we have very clear communication about expectations. So, when we're doing this, we should we should do this in a we should have a team approach. So the the, the oncologist, the physicist, the radiation therapist, medical dosimetrist, these people should be involved. I and not only specify what the equipment is, but understand what the, the limitations of the equipment is. Test those limitations when it when the equipment is installed and set up set up you know guidance for what are the 
the baseline is going to be, what are going to be the appropriate protocols. And this is, this is essential because you, you have to start from somewhere, but then you have to look back at that data. So you have that first baseline data, and then maybe you can improve upon it. And then back to the, the process mapping, which is, which is very essential, is identify the different steps that you're using your, your imaging. The, the, the imaging protocol is an essential early step. So what modality are you, you going to use to assess the tumor volume? Uh, is it CT? Is it MR? Is it PET? Is, are you going to use 4D? If, it, if it's MR, what, what, what sub-protocol are you going to use? Uh, what, what type of, and it's going to vary for the type of cancer and the body site. But having clear instructions and, and, and a clear understanding of, of what the expectation is will lead to better outcomes. And then understand what the uncertainty is. If you're gonna, if you're gonna contour on an MR and fuse it to a CT, that's got some uncertainty. The same with the PET. And the PET itself, there's, there's the, the CT, and then there's the, the PET. And those, things, those two images are acquired sequentially. So they could be offset. So being very careful and aware and, 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 and looking at those things is gonna help drive your, your quality. So, for an example, the imaging for lung SBRT. So when you're gonna when you're gonna define your 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 target with or for for lung SBRT, how will you define it? So the consensus is to, to use the MIP, the maximum intensity projection, and not everybody has 4D capabilities. And you can you can there are would have been. A, deemed acceptable substitutes you know you can do a slow scan you can do a multiple phase scan where you've got the max inhalation max exhalation and kind of blend those but you need to be consistent whatever it is that you're doing and, and whatever uh, limitations that you're facing then then comes the other the next decision what about for dose calculation are you going to use the the free breathing scan that, that, that has better or sharper uh, sharper image or are you going to use the average intensity? You know, both of these have their own uncertainties. Uh, I use the average intensity. I think some other institutions use average intensity. I know, I know some people that use helical. And neither of them is, is perfect. But understanding the, the uncertainty and, and, and accepting it one way or another, uh, whether you're going to add a margin or, 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 or whatnot, is very important. And the reason that we use that average intensity is because a comb beam, because it's delivered so slowly, it essentially becomes an average. So then when you're matching an average to an average, it's easier to get an alignment that, that makes sense. Whereas if you use the helical, you're only getting a quick snapshot and you might not have a alignment that makes as much sense. So for brain, are you going to use MR? Everyone uses MR if you're for, this, for the most part. So yes, but what MR protocol are you going to use? It's, it's not just T1 or T2. There's, there's MP Rage, there's Space, and each one of these has varying, they have different advantages and limitations. So having an awareness of those and, and having an accepted protocol is, is very important. So I've used the MP Rage um, previously, but in, in reading up on, on for this presentation, I, I found this, this, this article where they, they actually talked about space and it looks like you can, you can get a little better contrast with some lesions with this other protocol. And I think it's just important to, to kind of keep your eyes open. Now, back to the, the process mapping. So the selection of the imaging protocol has a lot of effects downstream. The, 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 the most immediate one is gonna be the target delineation. So just saw with, with that MP rage versus that space, that depending upon which one you, you selected, you may have contoured different, different volumes. So a big, a big known thing that impacts the volume is your slice thickness. So 
On the left, you've got one. You've got a, you've got a one millimeter slice thickness. On the on the right, you've got a three millimeter slice thickness, and you get very different volumes. So, we want to control the uncertainty. You know, not just control it, but but also acknowledge it. So if if you can't get a one millimeter, if you cannot get a one millimeter slice thickness, maybe you need to account for that uncertainty by by adding a margin in it because this looks like a piece of this would be missed do you want to do you want to you know what is it that you need to do to account for for that unknown it, it might be just to add a, a one millimeter margin and you feel you, you're you're always going to get it maybe you'll over treat but but you won't miss and and that's something that's a value judgment that the individual is going to have to make but if you can do finer resolution for smaller targets, it, it's going to make a big difference. Not only are you going to be more accurate in, in your delivery or your, 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 your expectation, but you're, you're, you're going to be doing better for the patient. So we want to control all the uncertainty and, 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 and be aware, you know, these simple things have, have, can have a large impact. So regarding that, 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 slice thickness so if you're if you're doing an mr if you're if you're if you're fusing or you're registering and fusing an mr to a ct that image grid is going to be realigning and it's gonna it's gonna have to resegment so when it, you when you copy your segmentation over to your, your ct it's not a it's not a perfect copy it's there's an there's interpolation involved so verifying that registration the the copying of the the segmentation is essential you're not going to get a one for one whether you're copying from a a one millimeter to a two millimeter ct scan or, or whatnot the, there's this needs to be i this needs to be examined on, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis and you need to, to, to maintain awareness of it. Even a good registration has an uncertainty of a, of a millimeter and that adds into your uncertainty in your dose delivery and your uncertainty on the patient setup. So just being aware is, is important. The, the image fusion with the, the PET, the, the CT and the, the, the PET those are two different images. E even those, they might look, or they might be, they might have the same frame of reference. They may be locked, but there are there are instances in which a patient has 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 gone into the table to get the CT coughed, so they've and they've moved a little bit, and then then got the PET, and so that those that PET CT may even be itself uh, misaligned. So paying attention to that and, and, and just having your eyes open to those things is very important. And we have, we've had lots of discussions about the, the PET CTs in our department during our peer review process. And the, the, our physicians use the PET as a guidance to drawing on the, the soft tissue that they see. We, we talked about this before, the, the the contouring uncertainty so the different physicians and this is this has been known for a long time i think i think there's been studies since ct has been introduced into radiotherapy treatment planning uh, different physicians will contour a target differently and it and like i mentioned before even the same physician will contour a target separately or differently throughout the day and just over time, there, there's just reproducibility and repeatability. It, it, you know, some of these lines are pretty close together and maybe it doesn't matter so much because the penumbra is gonna wash that out. But some of these other ones, this is, a, this is a big one. Do you draw that or do you not draw that? Apparently someone didn't draw that. And, and the big check for that is peer review. And I think with, with stereotactic, with such high doses, uh, it's, it's even more important than, than than with other things. In our center, we, we peer review every curative case. So we have calls 
and just like this, we, we don't actually um, have video, we, we, we just share a screen and the physicians from, from five or six centers, depends on the day, all, to, all together in the morning, review the new cases. So we do that on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And sometimes there's, there's some discussions or sometimes there's disagreement, but what you know is that you have multiple professional eyes looking at those contours and looking at that plan and discussing it. And, and I think that the, the value of peer review cannot be overstated. There's also consensus guidelines. These are, these are helpful for, for when, you're, when you're getting to an initial contour. This is a this is a this is a great study they did. You see the different red the different red contours are are the different physicians, and then the orange were, were the, was the consensus. So not only did they draw them independently, then they came together and made a statement about well, what do you think should be covered in cases like this? And you can see here there there was definitely some disagreement, and then the, the consensus of what to cover, and these. These documents exist obviously for spine, but there, there are other ones out there as well. So this kind of literature is, is very helpful. I mentioned this one last time, you know, that the, as we just talked about the slice thickness. So if you've got a one millimeter versus a three millimeter slice thickness, you're gonna get different volumes. That's the, the same thing in your treatment planning system. So one thing that's not always appreciated is that your the volumes that you calculate based on your image may be different than the volumes calculated on your DVH because they're using two different grids. There's the, the imaging matrix and then there's the dose matrix. And I think the biggest thing is that you're consistent across them. So, oops, sorry. So it's, if you're using a two millimeter, uh, imaging grid or a two millimeter, two, two millimeter slice thickness, then you should use a two millimeter DVH grid or, or, or dose ca calculation. It's not gonna save you or it's, it's not gonna improve things to use a one millimeter dose calculation uh, grid on a three millimeter CT scan because it, all you're doing is, is further interpolating information that's not there. So, so matching those up and being consistent is important. So if you've got a two millimeter slice thickness, use a two millimeter grid or, or a one millimeter, use a one millimeter. So the process mapping again, this is, this is very valuable. And, and it's interesting that this, this process map, it, it's, it's the start of the SRS treatment to the end of the SRS treatment. But I would say that, that this, this day of treatment has a lot of stuff going on in it. It's, there's, there's a lot of things happening on the day of treatment. And we're gonna talk more about that, especially with regard, regard to imaging. So with our treatment system, we know that there are several isocenters. There's the isocenter for the gantry, there's the isocenter for the collimator, there's the isocenter for the table, and then there's the isocenter for the imaging system. All of those isocenters create our effective isocenter, and that's really the best we can do but it's important that we know what that is and we test it, especially the imaging coincidence. So the, the Winston Lutz tool, the Winston Lutz, there's lots of tools I should say, but the, the, the concept of, of a BB that we, that we image and shift to the isocenter. And I, I think that this is an important thing that the, it shouldn't just be positioned with, with your lasers. Your lasers should obviously line up with the, the tool, but it's important that you image it and take it to where you're supposed to go or where, where your imaging center sends you because that's where you're gonna send the patient. Then deliver the radiation and ensure that you're, that you're in the right place. And in this case, they did gantry and they did couch, but it's also recommended that you do collimator rotation. If you're not doing couch kicks, you don't need to do those couch kicks but you should do the collimator because the, the odds are you're gonna rotate those, that collimator. And so that's just as important as any other change you, that you do, is that they all, they all play into that effective isocenter. This is just something to consider. This is just, this, this one side is kind of an aside. You know, that we, we focus on that, 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 we focus on that BB that at 
isosome. We focus on that, that, that single point at central axis. And so as you move off axis, uh, you know, things may shift out. You may be perfect on, online, but you may have a skew so that you, those, those, points, those points of distance might not be so great. Uh, and that's a very important thing that I think we need to consider um, as we move forward with single isocenter multi-metastasis. Multi, uh, so there are different tools. These are commercial tools, but you can be creative with the tools that you use. This, this one actually has, have, has BBs in, in multiple places, and it has a MLC pattern that essentially does a, does a Winston Lutz for each of these little spots. This is a, this is a creative this is a creative device, but I think there's some creative people probably on the line that could make something similar. There's also this, this is a service provided where they do gel dosimetry. And gel dosimetry is tricky, so if, you, if, if you're not familiar with it, 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 it can maybe seem like a very tough lift, but you know, it's something that we need to think about with regards to multi-mets and, and especially with single isocenter is, is our testing may need to evolve. And the phantoms, there are many ways to, to, to make a phantom. I use this as for imaging isocenter, but I wanted to kind of go back to the, the, the end to end. It can, like I said, it can be a piece of ham. In this case, these, these people made a, an isocenter tool out of Lego. And, and the cool thing about Lego is that they're, very, they're manufactured very precisely. They always fit together. They, they, they have very, very fine manufacturing constraints. So the, the, the authors of this paper took advantage of that and they, they made a device that they knew would be a, a specific size. And they were able to use that to, to verify their, their imaging ISIS center. So, you know, extra points for creativity. You can, you can create tools. And, and I know we're all busy, but we don't necessarily need that $30,000 QA tool to, to assess the quality of, of what we're going to deliver to our patients. So back to image guidance. So once we've, I, I, once we've uh, ensured that, that we are on target, that we are, you know, at the ISO center, that we're going to be, we're going to be delivering what we're treating, uh, or we're going to be delivering where, where we, where we place the patient. The, the daily image guidance, it's most powerful um, when it's used under the direct supervision of a radiation oncologist. And the, the reason for that is that the, the, the oncologist has the, the, the training in anatomy. We've all studied, all of us professionals in radiation oncology have studied anatomy, but few of us, I, 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 would, I would say that, that only a few of us, that the radiation oncologists have actually been very intimate with the anatomy in terms of gross anatomy and whatnot. So that, that experience is what really comes into play. They also know where, where that, that, that tumor is. So they know what they want. So with stereotactic treatments, that direct supervision is, is very much encouraged and, and in some places mandated. But we know that without correction, we're gonna have a lot, a lot larger margin Offline correction, where, they, where, where, where afterwards they're given guidance about where it should be, there's going to be even larger margin. It's that online correction, and that online correction is a function of education. And, and I want to say that it's a function of education because it's not limited to the, the oncologist to do a good shift. But until the education is there, uh, they are the most appropriate. That education can also be transferred through clear instructions, being very clear about how to align, what to align, and that may be involved with the, the, the oncologist coming to the first few treatments. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in terms of conventional or fractionation, not necessarily just stereotactic, but coming and taking the time to, to help show where to align. In this case, on the left, you've got one that's matching to the, to the bone, obviously still, obviously missing the target. And on the on the right, you've got one matching to the tumor, and the the target's right on. And I I, I say it's obvious, but it, it might not be obvious if you've got someone that's been practicing for 20 years and they're used to using X-ray films and aligning to bone. They're not doing anything wrong by aligning to bone. They're they're doing what their experience has told them. So 
unless there's clear instructions on how to align. And this, in this case, it's kind of easy with a, with a lung tumor. But when you start getting down into the abdomen, it gets a little bit fuzzier. So having, having good, clear instructions is critical to, to maintaining quality. Also, so I mentioned earlier about matching the, the, the average to the comb beam for the lung because they, they, because they, they, they match up very well. You know, optimizing the IGRT for brain, you know, it'll give you a better, a better picture that'll match up to the, or get closer to the quality of that, that, that CT sim. And in this case, the, this, this study, I think this, is, this was from Henry Ford, they looked at the different, different protocols, they looked at, the, at, at different doses, and they, they said, you know, in the case of, of stereotactic, giving a little bit more dose, you know, 13 uh, MA versus 15 MA, is, is, it's worth it. The, the gains that we get in the ability to match, localize, and align the, the, the patient, it's worth it. So optimizing these type of things can make it easier for, for therapists and for all professionals to, to, to match up and what's important. So this is another process map. So knowing your uncertainty is essential. And this is, this is, this is what we do in an end-to-end -end test. The end to end test, we're really gonna just be in this square here where we're, where we're, we're drawing on a, on a phantom and, and, we're, and, we're, and we're moving on down the line. I circled the areas that directly involve imaging, but we, we can work to minimize any, anything, any uncertainties, but first we have to identify them. And for a range of IGRT solutions, uh, it's in the order of, of one to two millimeters. And, and really, it's really hard to get better than two. Um, getting down to one, we may be able to do that on the, on the treatment delivery, but then there's, there's uncertainty in the imaging. But we should know what that is for our own situation. You know, it, it's gonna be different for an ELECTA unit than it is for a Varian unit. It's gonna be different for, for someone who's, who's fusing MRs to, to their CTs. It's gonna be different for, 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 for a range of things. So it's important to know our own system and the way that we, that we gain that, that intimate knowledge of our own system is by performing those end-to-end -end tests and then seeking to improve. So I, I, I know I talked fast, I, I'm sorry. This, this is actually the, the speed that I talk, but the imaging is especially online IGRT is an invaluable tool that allows for real-time quality assurance. And that's exactly what this is showing is, is, is tracking of the shifts and finding out when things need to be, to be corrected. But the IGRT should be used in light of the big picture and, and we really should seek to understand our uncertainties and then, and then work to minimize them. And, and that's, I, I hope that you all found this helpful and I, I'm, I'm very happy to share and uh, thank you. Awesome, thank you very much, Peter. <clears throat> I guess we'll open up for questions. I actually have a question to start. Mm -hmm. in, in your clinic, if, when you go to say measure, take measurements of your SRS or SBRT fields, what, what equipment do you use? Do you use like a map check or some sort of device like that? So we, we, have, we have a map, we have a few things at my, my clinic. We have a map check two and a map fan. We have EPID, portable symmetry. And then we have Mobius. So we actually use Mobius, but we validated it by cross-checking it across three different systems. And before we implement any program, we do a whole end-to-end. -end. And what I like to do, it's, it's, it might not be an option for others, is I like to credential, credential through the RTOG for anything. That might be, it might be a little more difficult to do, but there's nothing that you can't, you can't maybe ask a third party to come and, and do an end-to-end -end test. But I, I think that the, just having fresh eyes or a, a second set of eyes is very important. Mm -hmm. And by, by Mobius, you mean that's based on the control points? That is based on the Dynalog, yes. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think that some people, and, I, and I've practiced this in the past where we've done an ion chamber measurement for everyone, but we have, we've, we've done a lot of cross-validation and we feel confident in it. 
Okay, so now we can open up for questions from whoever. If you have a question, feel free to turn on your microphone and ask away. <clears throat> Ahora tenemos tiempo para hacer preguntas. Para cualquiera que tenga una pregunta, puede prender su micrófono. También las preguntas pueden, eh, pueden escribirlos en la cajita de chat. I like David's uh, wallpaper. <laughs> I, I think you went through things very clearly, Peter, and excellent slides. I appreciate the message that, that you're passing on because we know that, you know, even though this is just a one hour call, we, we can't do everything, but at least we can deliver a take home message. And hopefully everyone on this call, you know, even after this curriculum finishes, you can remember some of the things that we talked about and, you know, maybe have conversations in your group. You know, we're all one body, all trying to do the best for our patients. And how can we work together as a team to provide the best care in our department? And also, you know, maybe to be a resource for other clinics. I'm going to make a comment in English or Spanish. Probably okay. start. <laughs> okay, that's a little easy for me and at least in technical matters in English. So I always recognize the, the uncertainties when you use imaging. In particular, I'm coming to a world we're using protons or part charged particle therapy. It's a little different and has their own challenges by itself com compared with the conventional. But no matter what, the imaging that we are used to work with is basically the CT, uh, MRI, a PET if we are lucky. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're dealing with degrees of grade of pixels. So the resolution or the technique that we are using create an uncertainty, as you described very well, Peter. But I, we must recognize this is particularly important for brain metastasis, when we need to deal areas that have a different radio sensitivity, and we need to be very aware of the potential normal tissue responses. And in particular, certain areas like the hippocampal areas or sometimes of the cortex. So it's very important to think about it, the limitation of the techniques and when we can't turn and you, you show very, very eloquently the difference between observers. At the end of the day, how we delimitate the area is between our eyes, our brain and the image is a limitation and the variation between operators is, is, is in, <laughs> important. So that's the reason in certain areas and in particle therapy in particular, they are kind of move uh, of create different techniques, for example, intelligent artificial intelligence, just to remove, in a way, the variation of the human factor and look a more, more objective thing. So, but I think it's recognized our limitations in terms of imaging quality and resolution is very important, in particular with brain structures when we're talking about metastatic formations and we, how we deal with that. Absolutely. And also, I think the, the point you made about imaging protocol, that, you know, we can, we can look as much on the contouring as we want and, and all those things, but, but really starting at, at, at ground zero. And I know some of the attendees on this call and, and in the past have, have asked, you know, what is your protocol? What is your protocol? And I think people are interested in that. And I don't know, sometimes it, it's hard when there's so much information floating around to know what do I trust and what do I make a protocol for our center. I know that in, in Lima, for instance, at Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Neoplásicas, es, están empezando o pensando en hacer SPRT para próstata, pero uh, va a ser algo nuevo y me están preguntando qué es el protocolo, protocol que usamos en UCSF. Or Dr. Hiram Gay from WashU, I think, gave an excellent lecture on prostate SPRT 
and sort of shared what their protocol is. For everyone on this call, in the US there, there is heterogeneity, different centers, you know, whether it's MD Anderson or Sloan Kettering, will have different protocols. There's, there's no one right protocol, but I think it's very important, not just as an individual, but for everyone on your team working together. You know, when one physicist works with a different doctor and then another doctor, that those doctors are, are helping give the same instructions. And I think that'll help improve your, your quality of the care that you deliver in your center. Well, these are these are great points. I mean, I, I think anything you can do to to at least be consistent in your own center, then you can make you can make a, some judgments about the the quality of your your delivery. If you're not consistent, you can't you can't track what your outcomes are. Well, you, did we have what what was our dose coverage at that time, or what was our imaging protocol that time? If you're consistent, uh, then you then you can improve, and and that doesn't mean that you can't update your knowledge and change based on new, new things, but having a, you know, you don't want to be doing it six different ways in your department because then that also leads to the opportunity for an error to be made. Well, oh, I thought I was supposed to use that imaging protocol. No, this is what we do. This is how we outlined it. Um, and you can be consistent and you can measure your outcome. Are there any uh, last statements? I don't know, maybe one person from each center, if, if you want to be brave enough to turn on your microphone and, and speak, even if it's just to say hello, or, or I don't know if you want to say thank you. <laughs> where, where is everyone from? I can start. Many thanks to, to Peter and all the team for this wonderful lecture. And that, that sentence that I wrote on the chat is a sentence you, you told us the, the last third, uh, Tuesday. Um, it's right. We don't see what, what we don't measure. So it's, it's the moment that we need to, to start and, and measure everything we do uh, in our clinic. I'm from Colombia, but I work in Peru. I'm living here since six years ago, and uh, I'm very pleased and grateful for all this opportunity you have gave us. And uh, on behalf of all our team, I give you my, my thanks. Gracias, David. Ha sido un placer estar con ustedes. And maybe someone from Hospital Regabliati. Puede ser en español también. ¿Hay alguien de Argentina? <laughs> Aquí no todavía, la próxima vez. No sé. Yeah. Yo veo a Alberto Adrada y Zogeliteo de, de Cali, Colombia. No sé si, si tienen acceso a su micrófono. Eh, sí, estoy. <laughs> Ay, hola, Escucho. buenas noches. Buenas noches. Sí, escuché toda la charla, estuvo bastante interesante. Eh, una de las cosas que me llamó la atención fue el test de Winston Lutz que lo hace con láminas haciendo una cruz. ¿Eso tiene alguna ventaja? Porque la mayoría siempre que lo he visto y, y que lo hago es formando un cuadrado. So he had a question about the something that, that, that caught his attention was the Winston Lutz test, and that he he saw that this has been shown with a cross, but every time he's seen it, he's seen it with a with like a square or a rectangle. Yeah, I, that's actually I, that's the reason I showed that one. It's all I've always done it with the square, but I liked that 
it was actually, it was still showing whether or not it was in the center of the field. So how you, you choose that center of the field is, is kind of arbitrary. And what I really wanted to show too, was that there, there are lots of different ways to do these tests. And, and what I said before about, you don't need that fancy tool to do that. You just have to have something that makes sense scientifically. So you have a, a BB and you can measure whether it's at the center of that field or not. The, the shape of that field, it actually is giving you more information about the, the MLC motions too. So I hadn't seen that before either, and that's why I showed it. Yeah, that caught my attention too. I thought that was an interesting idea. Yeah. Yeah. Buena observación, Alberto. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to peel an orange. That's, that's my... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, alguien más de Perú, de, de Lima? O, o otros uh, ciudad en Perú? <laughs> Gracias por el aplauso, Gonzalo. <laughs> okay, well, we want to respect everyone's time, but th this has been a lot of fun for us, you know, on behalf of the Rise Contra Cancer team, and uh, all the volunteers that have gone into this, you know, Peter helping conclude, but also many of the other educators that were involved throughout this journey. You know, it's been a real pleasure for them to join you and to get to know your clinics a little bit. And we hope we can remain connected. A special thanks to uh, everyone at the clinic who was a coordinator. So we had Sandra Guzman, we had Milagros Rodriguez, we had Lucia and David Martinez and Juan Trejo and Dr. Alina Loiza and uh, Zoheli Teo. You know, they really were heroes for, for helping organize and, and help share everything that we shared with them. So special thank you to them. And then uh, lastly, special thank you to Michael for really stepping up and being a leader and helping, you know, dedicate each of these evenings to to be here Ramsey for helping you know he's aspiring radiation oncologist and so you know he's this is a good introduction for him but uh, you know he's really enjoyed getting to to help organize these things too and then Betty and Samiksha who some of you got to meet in person but they've really helped me with keeping things organized so we would like to send one final survey to all of you who participated and may, and also to people who weren't able to join the call. Es una encuesta final. Es breve, como dos o tres minutos. Pero por favor, si pueden hacerlo y llenarlo. Gram, uh, Ramsey compartió con recibir un link. Es una encuesta por RedCap. Oportunidad para cualquier retroalimentación que nos ayudaría. Y también para describir eh, qué es su confianza en ciertos temas ahora. Eso nos va a ayudar mucho con hacer una publicación para describir de este currículo. Y Ramsey va a compartir un examen. Va a ser muy similar como el examen que hicieron al principio. Y vamos a, a ver los scores. El examen agradecemos mucho por su uh, cooperación y ayudar de, de hacerlo. Es, es algo también necesario para recibir de participación, como mencionamos al principio, y también nosotros hemos tomado la asistencia en cada, y es, estar, eh, estaremos revisando todo y en contacto con los coordinadores para, para mandar a las, los certificados. También quiero darles unas palabras diciendo que estoy muy agradecido por ese tiempo que he pasado con todos ustedes. Yo, siendo físico médico, nuevito, yo he aprendido mucho con, con ustedes y estoy agradecido por su tiempo dedicado a esto. Muchísimas gracias. Y con eso creo que podemos concluir, ¿no es cierto? Excelente. 
and you can't see this or you can't hear this, but if you look at the chat, Peter, you can see people saying thank you. Milagro says, yo no puedo poner mi audio ahora, pero les agradezco mucho todo. Awesome classes. Thank you, Ben. I mean, this is this is great. And, and I want to let everybody know that I learn a lot whenever I do a presentation because it, there's so much literature out there. It's, it's, it's wild. There's a lot of information out there. And, and participating in these as, a, as both as an educator and just, um, just being around others, it's constant. We're, there's always something new to learn. So thank you, Ben, for organizing these. I, I have a great time. Thank you. Great. Well, we all have a good time. Stay safe, wash your hands, take <laughs> care of the world, <laughs> and we'll see you uh, next time. No, no, olviden, no se olviden de la biología. La de biología es importante. <risa> Yo espero okay. que nos podamos encontrar de nuevo en el futuro, en algún momento. Seguro. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Hasta luego. Sí. Ok. Gracias. Muchas gracias a todos.